good morning, everybody. It is Tuesday, almost said Monday. It is Tuesday, February 2nd, 2021. And congratulations to you for making it to the fifth Tuesday of 2021. Congratulations to you. I see that we've got some, some folks with us today. We're grateful that you're here. Thanks for being a part of this really short Preacher's Pen podcast that we pull the audio out of this video cast to make a podcast. And you can find us at anchor.fm forward slash Preacher's Pen. If you've got some podcast software, you can go check that out. And uh, if you're looking for us on YouTube, just look up the Preacher's Pen and it's going to be there. But we're glad that you're here. We're going to talk about two words that are in Hebrew that have to do with our God. So thanks for being here today and thank you for being with us. We've got a little cup of coffee today and I hope that you have too to start this Tuesday up on. But, you know, there is a person in the Bible called Abram. Abram was a fascinating individual, in my opinion, because there's such a relationship with him and God that it's one to be desired, and it's one that many of us really want to have, and we want to be part of that relationship. But we have to look at not only Abram's actions, but the words that he spoke. And I believe that the words Abram spoke to God and even spoke to the people around him show his relationship was one of extreme value. In fact, in Genesis chapter 15, we're going to look at verses 1 through 4 today. We're going to pull two words out of that passage, and we're going to see how that can apply to our lives. You know, we can be like Abram in a lot of ways but in our actions, but let's look, if we can, at his language. In Genesis chapter 15, beginning in verse 1, it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision and said this. Notice the words that are spoken. It says, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham, or Abram, excuse me, continues and says, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. Notice verse 4. Verse 4 says, And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. But I want you to go back, if you can, to verse 2, when Abram says, O Lord God. Abram uses a term there called Adonai Jehovah in the Hebrew, and the term itself is greatly significant when we begin looking into the Bible to see exactly what that term means. The term Yahweh is greatly significant, and it's significant because the Jews looked at this word as something that they wouldn't even say. Many times they would, I am told throughout history, if they were even going to write close to this word or this word, they would have to use a new pen, new ink, go go cleanse themselves, come back, write it, then go back to writing in regular because it was a word that was highly valued. So in that, instead of writing the word Yahweh, not even to pronounce that in that particular time, they would say Adonai, which meant my Lord, which is significant because Jews, being the children of God, saw a relationship from very on in their life all the way through their lives as they continued to seek and to serve God. Now, there were some speed bumps along the way, but we know that they were seeking to serve and they were seeking to follow God. So as you and I consider that today, let's consider the words Adonai Jehovah. Now, to be able to do this, in our English translations, we do not read the words Adonai Jehovah, but instead what we find is we find the term my God. Now, as we think about what that means, it is used over 300 times in the Old Testament, and it's exclusively plural and possessive, meaning that there is a relationship, and there's a relationship among God's people with God. In the New Testament, in the Greek, we find the word kyrios, and that is used several hundred times in reference to the Lord Jesus. But here's the interesting thing. The words both mean master. In fact, we sing of some songs that say, Make me a servant, Lord, make me like you. We talk about Lord Jesus serving God. We run across terms talking about bond servant. But a servant or a bond servant or even a slave in the New Testament, they had to have a master. So I would ask you the question this morning. 
The question is very simple. The question is very direct. But the question is, who is your master? As you think about the master of your life, who is that? Is that God? Is that the, I don't, uh, the Adonai Jehovah that Abram talks about? But who's the master of your life? So let me share with you a few things this morning, maybe for you to think about, maybe that you can gain. Now, each of these things will be available in just a little while on thepreacherspen.org. You'll be able to go to thepreacherspen.org forward slash my Lord. My Lord God is what it will be, preacherspen.org forward slash my Lord God in just a little while. And these notes will be up on the screen for you if you're watching on our video cast. But when we think about God, let's ask some questions about our relationship. And the first question that I would ask you, based upon Abram's words of Adonai Jehovah, is this. When you think of God, is it my Lord or is it just Lord? Do you have a relationship with God? And to the extent, let's dig into this question just a little bit more. Because there's a difference in knowing God and having a personal relationship with Him based upon the blood of His Son, Jesus. But is God a part of your life, or is God master of your life? You see, if God is a master of your life, then you are His servant, and you're willing to serve Him. But if God is a part of your life, what you can do is you can take God, and you can move God over to a different location, and you can compartmentalize God, and, and you can only bring God out whenever you really want to serve Him. If God is just a part of your life and not master of your life, then you can only bring him out on Sunday mornings. You can only bring him out when you go to church and everything is fine because at church no one ever has any problems and I'm here to serve God. But if he's just a part of your life, not only do you bring him out on Sunday mornings, but you can put him away on Sunday afternoons. In fact, if God is a part of your life and not master of your life, you don't even go to church on Sunday night. Who needs Bible study? I mean, I just... I've got God in a box, and I just bring him out whenever I want to. What about during the week? If God's a part of your life and not a master of your life, you only bring him out when you have problems. When things aren't going your way and you call out to God and you say, God, help me, help me, then when God helps you, you put him back in a box. See, the children of Israel did that. In fact, there's a cycle of things the children of Israel did. They would get really, really close to God then as they got close and they got prosperous, they would forget about God. And as they forgot about God, they'd get to the bottom. They would, they would bottom out. And when they bottomed out, then guess what would happen? As they bottomed out, then all of a sudden they would start to move back to God because they wanted to know more about Him. You see, when we think about compartmentalizing God, we've got to be very, very careful. Because when we do that, we realize something. We realize that God is not our master. One of the scariest verses, or a couple of the scariest verses, I believe, in the Bible are Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through verse 23. And in that passage, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. That is a frightening passage. Because not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will be there. We've often heard preachers, and as preachers, we love to say this phrase, I think. Sitting in a chicken house doesn't make you a chicken. Sitting in the garage doesn't make you a car. And sitting in a church building doesn't make you a Christian. Well, that's exactly right. Because you can sit in a church building, and God doesn't have to be your master. He can just be a part of your life. You see, if God is the master of our life, we continue to do some things. We continue to seek God. That's what I want you to remember. I want you to remember, first of all, is God a part of your life or is God master of your life? Second of all, ask yourself the question, are you willingly seeking God? A couple weeks ago, we mentioned the passage in Acts chapter 17. And in that passage, Paul says that God is not far from each one of us, that we should seek Him. We have the ability to seek the face of God. We do that because we're faithful people, not just believing people, but faithful people. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6 says, For without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, there's your belief, but you must also believe that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. You see, if God is master of our life, we're going to constantly seek him. We're going to want to do the best with everything that he's given us. I would refer you to the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25. In the parable of the talents, the master goes on a journey, but he leaves his servants with talents. 
It's money. But he leaves those based upon their ability because he wants them to use their gifts. Two used them, one didn't. And we know what happens. But are you willing to have that relationship with God as being your master? you got to think about that first. Number two, are you willing to seek him? Number three, are you willing to know more about God? As you seek God, you will start to find out more about God. Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6 says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. See, if you and I want to have this relationship with God, we've got to know who he is. And we know who he is through his word. I, I, would, I would really encourage you today to go out and look at Psalm 18, to just read that passage, whether it's during lunch or whether it's during dinner, devotional time with your family, maybe tomorrow morning, maybe this evening. But spend some time in Psalm 18 and see what it's like to get to know God. God is someone that many people picture as an old man with a lightning bolt sitting up in heaven and he's just waiting to strike somebody down. But yet, God wants us to seek him and he wants us to know him. So I would ask you, is God the master of your life or is God just a part of your life? Are you seeking his face? Do you want to know more about God? Are you willing to serve him? See, we've been given abilities that we can serve God throughout our lives, but are we willing to do that? Paul says in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 to the Roman church, he says, I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Some translations may say spiritual worship. In verse 2, he says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, that you may prove what is the perfect and acceptable and good will of God. You see, if we're willing to serve God, we're willing to have him in our life to be a part of that. In Exodus chapter 23, it says that if we serve God, God will bless us. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 14 and verse 15 tell us that if, if we go to God and we serve him, God is going to take care of us. And as Christians, we know that and we hear about that. Sometimes we even struggle with that. But the question we have to ask is, are we serving God? Is God a part of our life, or is he the master of our life? So if you, ask her that, if you answer that question, is God a part of your life or master of your life, you need to make him master of your life, you need to seek his face, you need to get to know him, and you need to serve him. And finally, finally, number five, are you committed to him? If you're committed to God, it's going to take all of you. It's not going to take part of you. It's going to take all of you. You'll be a better person. You'll live a better life. And most of all, you'll have eternity as your home. You know, God tells us in his word in Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 19, to lay up treasures in heaven, not treasures here on earth. Because we know from 1 John chapter 2, the things of earth are passing away and everything that we see about us is, but those that do the will of God will abide forever. But also, Continuing that in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24, it says, No man can serve two masters. He's going to love the one. He's going to hate the other. He's going to cling to one. He's going to despise the other. It says, No one can serve God in mammon. Mammon's the old word for money. Because we know that money, or love of money, excuse me, is the root of all evil, as Paul tells Timothy. Because money and the love of it, see, it can become all about self many times. Money can be used for great good. But if it just becomes about getting more and wanting more and taking that over the place of many other things in our life, we can become very troubling as a person. We can become very troubling as a people. So I would encourage you, and once again, think about this from the perspective of where you need to be in your life. And that question is this. Is God a part of your life or is God the master of your life? For us to truly be following God. He must be our master. He must be our Adonai, Jehovah. I would encourage you to go back and read Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, those other scriptures that we mentioned, and just realize that God wants us to seek him. God wants us to know him. God wants us to serve him because God wants us to have a home with him. But thank you for being here today. I hope that these have been encouraging thoughts for you. Check us out on thepreacherspen.org here in just a little while. You'll be able to see that. If you're not following us on our podcast, you can go to anchor.fm forward slash preacherspen or just go to preacherspenpodcast.com. You can follow us there on our YouTube channel. Just search for The Preacher's Pen. 
You can look for our logo that's contained at the bottom of the screen here, and you can follow us along. But thanks for being here today, and we hope that you have an excellent day, and we look forward to talking to you soon. But be blessed, and have a beautiful February 2nd.